Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Magic Occult Radio. I am your host, Father Talisim McKnight, and I'm here with my fellow host, Father Robert Powell. Father. And, hey, what's up? Uh, what's up, man? All right, and today we are getting into using dreams to communicate with spirits and classical grimoires. So dreams are actually part of Renaissance magical tradition. It's part of the Renaissance. It's part of medieval magic. So there's no modern stuff here, no modern stuff. We are sticking to the classical materials um, from late antiquity, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. So dreams were used in the classical grimoire, uh, grimoires to gain access to spirits. So yeah, so how, how's it going over there? Um, it's actually going really good. It's kind of funny because uh, yeah, I've been doing prayer-based dream magic uh, again with the sham angels. And um, uh, that, because even before I knew about the book that the divine cabal I, I always did that i guess you could say prayer dream magic it's where you would ask a question and get answers and all that and then i said oh wow that there's actual grimoires that actually have pentacles for this or certain systems that that specify around this and uh, it's really, really interesting yeah you really don't hear a lot about it and it appears in the key of solomon um it appears in the Greek magical papyri. It appears in even Agrippa mentions uh, using dreams to access spirits. And you see it in pseudo Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy. And um, I believe I don't have the exact source, but I believe I've seen part of it in the Picatrix, but I'm not sure. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I was going through Stephen Skinner's Veritable Key of Solomon, and it was really interesting because there's an actual Key of Solomon based specifically around dreams. And um, he lists it as an authentic Key of Solomon book, and, and that really intrigued me. And plus, uh, with the group work that we did uh, with the Sham Angels, that was really revealing as well. And I, and I feel like that these grimoires what they do is they take dream magic and we'll go into the history a little bit, but I feel like grimoires, especially there are people that practice dream magic already. And there's a methodology that these books put into it as most grimoires, as, as me and you know, they treat this, this magic and even any kind of magic like a, like a science almost. There's a specific method, a specific layout. So in this, we, we are going to be breaking down that method or that science and uh, going really deep into it. Yeah, absolutely. And Renaissance, uh, Renaissance magic is like the most scientific thing. You know, it's like everything is a science. The astrology, the implements of the magician, everything is there for a reason. And in modern times, people try to dispense with that. They're like, oh, I've, 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 re I've seen the secret documentary. I don't need that. Um, but, I mean, we do need it. Like, the, the implements are an integral part of the system. And the way that I teach, at least, the way that I teach is um, a, a traditionalist grimoire perspective. So that is how we are approaching that. No shortcuts, um, no modern stuff. We are sticking to the classical material. And it's really a great feeling to be able to bring that to people because you don't hear a lot about it, man. You know, uh, there are plenty of people, they, they talk about a lot of different systems, you know, chaos magic and, and hoodoo and Wicca and all these different traditions, which we both studied ourselves. But Really, Renaissance magic is a totally different creature. And I think it's important to, if you really want to understand the system, to, to understand it in itself and to try to discard um, 
with a lot of the other stuff. Try to understand this. Try to see what the grimoires are telling you. Read the grimoires, pour through them. Um, imbue yourself with the teachings of the grimoires. And I, I think that's really, really important to, to understand where the texts themselves are coming from. So, so yeah. So where are some of the, the earliest sources that we see references to communication with spirits through dreams? Well, actually, this is really interesting. Um, there are some more obvious sources, yet there are some more hidden sources to this. Now, the oldest text that we have in regards to where the story arc doesn't actually stem from anything else but dream work. And this comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh. There are uh, two or three scenes in there to where Gilgamesh has a dream of, of prophecy. One is actually from a uh, prostitute that Enkidu was sleeping with, who said that Gilgamesh would have a dream. And the other was the god of the mountain, uh, to where Gilgamesh would ask for a dream three times, and Enkidu would interpret it, kind of like John Dee and Edward Kelly with the, uh, um, what was it, with the Nokian magic, which is interesting. Now, another source of this actually comes into the Greek magical papyri. There are several spells in there that actually talk about how to make a lover obsessed with you and how you can appear in their dreams as well. So the thing is, dreams, at least in this sense, they were seen as a doorway. Now. We know that dream work was a big part of the uh, pre-Christian era because it's really important to note that when we look through the different parts of Greece, um, for example, um, this uh, Asclepios, the son of Apollo, he, ha he had a temple in Greece. And people would actually uh, take an herb and they would get their diagnosis through a dream. And we, yeah. we can... Sleep, yeah. sleep temples or whatever, yeah. Yeah, sleep temples, yeah. And it's interesting because we can take this even a little deeper. Even in the Bible, there are several places. There's the most obvious sources. Uh, we have the two Josephs. Uh, Joseph, the son of Jacob, who actually interpreted dreams while he was in... Uh, prison out of all the places, and then he became the second in charge of Egypt. And then there's Joseph, uh, Jesus's stepfather, if you want to call him that, and um, the husband of Mary. And interestingly enough, um, there's a, Solomon got his wisdom through a dream with God. God said, I can give you anything. What do you want? And Solomon said, I want wisdom. So, um, angels, they, they like to communicate in dreams. Jacob's ladder was another overarching point to where he, there, he saw angels going up and down this ladder from heaven to earth. So dreams play an integral part to, to the connection with the divine. Even in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods were seen as to come through with dreams a lot of times because uh, we have limited speech. There are so many limitations in the physical. And sometimes the best way for, for a God or an angel or these spirits to communicate with us is through dreams. And I actually credit a lot of my past nightmares to evil spirits, oddly enough. And, so, and we become vul vulnerable when we sleep. And there's a lot of different methods you can actually use to protect yourself from spirits when you're sleeping or and ways to do dream magic safely. So we do have to put a warning on there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really do not recommend. Please do not. Don't do this with goetic demons. Please don't. Um, please do not. I mean, ultimately, people can do what they want. But there's my warning. Don't try this shit with goetic demons. Um, I think it's dumb, and you could very easily hurt yourself.
because you're putting yourself in a vulnerable state. And hey, it's not a popular opinion, but I've had this opinion a long time. Um, don't do this shit with goetic demons. Do not. That is my warning. Uh, very bad idea. In fact, I wouldn't do this with anything that's sublunary. Um, I would focus on planetary spirits and things like that. And you can base it on astrology. You know, you can do it during the planetary hour or try to get the planet in the ascendant rising or there, there are lots of things that you can do with that. And the basic method, the basic method, how do you do this? Again, I would be very careful who you do this with because you're vulnerable. And in dream magic, it's not like you're seeing something in a scrying crystal. And it's not like you see something circling around your circle or you're, it's not like you're seeing a form taking shape in incense smoke. No. In dream magic, the spirit can reach out and grab you. The spirit can literally reach out and touch you. Um, yeah, you got to be very careful with this stuff. Um, in fact, we had a lot of really, we had some really bad experiences. I don't, I don't think we should go into totally how the shit hit the fan, but we were part of a group working with dream magic and basically people were getting sick and all kinds of stuff was happening. And uh, we decided to take a more traditional approach and then all of the ill effects, they went away, but this is definitely not safe. It's not safe. Um, there's no circle. There's no protective boundary. You're basically inviting something to come into your consciousness. Okay. So just like you wouldn't sleep with anybody, or I hope you wouldn't, <clears throat> I hope that people wouldn't just have sex with just anyone. Um, think of it like that. You wouldn't have sex with anyone. This is a very intimate thing. Um, so I'd be very careful who you work with. Um, so shim angels. That is a really good thing. The Shem Angels are very quick to, to interact in that way. And the Arbitel, the Olympic spirits, are good for working with dreams as well. Um, so, yeah, just be careful. Um, I would not do this with anything that can be destructive or chaotic. You want something that's peaceful and relaxed and chill. You know what I mean? That's the type of thing that you want to have this type. Every spirit, okay, grimoire magic is a science. It is a scientific method. It is precise. Every group of spirits has a way that you work with them. And this is the traditional perspective. Demons, there's a whole lot of protection um, and all kinds of stuff that goes into demonic magic. Angels, it's more of an invitation and a request. And uh, every, every group has a way that you work with them. So when it comes to dream magic, I would stick with angels. Or if you're pagan, you can try this with pagan deities. Um, so, for example, you know, like you said, the sleep temples, they did this with Hermes or, or uh, Apollo or whatever. So you can try this with pagan deities if you're pagan or Wiccan or something or angels or planetary things, but I would not recommend this for anything that's sublunary. So, so yeah, I would not try this uh, to summon Cerberus, <laughs> the hound that governs Hades or something. Okay. I would not, I don't recommend trying it with that. So, yep. What about the PGM? Uh, you saw a whole bunch of different references to dream work in the PGM, right? Greek magical papyri. Oh, yeah. There's a ton of them. Actually, and most of it isn't for beneficial purposes either. And it shows how this can be abused. Most of it is actually how to make lovers obsessed with you. Actually, it's in the Rabbi Solomon, too. In the Rabbi Solomon, in chapter... Seven, I no, no, uh, it, I think it was chapter 14. No, 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 not 14. 17, yeah, chapter 17. And a Rabbi Solomon as well. 
it's about uh, getting <laughs> your lover obsessed with you through dreams. This is an, an old concept, and that's what most of the PGM is about, uh, and the love spells more specifically. More or less lusting or loving after someone, and um, I there really weren't any revenge spells or anything. It was just mainly love stuff, which would make sense in a way, because let's think of it this way. If you have someone and you want them to come to you, the, the best way to have that happen is to penetrate their subconscious. I mean, it's manipulative, but this is a tactic that's been around for 2,000 plus years. And that's yeah. what most of the PGM is, is actually. You know, even um, when I was getting into voodoo and really studying that tradition, voodoo, um, a lot of times the lawa, a person's lawa or spirits, will come to them in dreams to, to make their presence known. So, I mean, it's something you see in so many different traditions. I'm, I would say it's probably, I mean, it's found everywhere. And it's probably way predates any of the written uh, sources that we have. It's probably one of the most ancient methods for interacting with spirits. So the basic method, I'm not one to leave people hanging on their seats. I'm the type of person that I want to give people a practice. I want people when they listen to a video, they have a practical method that they can put into practice. Okay, so how do you do this? Let's just cut through all the stuff and jump to it. How do you do it? Well, basically you do a ritual to call on the spirit. It can be however you want to do it, okay? Um, however you want to do it. Whether you just want to do a call, you know, you can get in a circle and do a full um, calling or whatever. It can be a prayer, whatever. Basically, the first step, well, first there should be purifications and things like that, ideally. But basically, you call on the spirit, you tell it to come to you in a dream, and then you place its sigil or its name under your pillow, and you go to sleep. That's basically it. Do a ritual to call the spirit, ask it to come to you in a dream, put its sigil under your pillow, go to bed, go to sleep. Now, you're really not going to get much out of this if you can't remember your dreams. I'm serious. This is a common thing. People will remember drifting off. They heard a spirit calling their name, calling their name, and then they don't remember the interaction. So before you do this, it's a good idea to have a dream journal. And I'm not bringing in new age here. It's just practical. You need to start writing down your dreams every day so that you can get in the habit of remembering them. Now, some people are used, they're, they're good at remembering dreams. But for those people that don't normally recall their dreams, you're going to want to open up a dream journal and start recording your dreams every day just as a practice. I'm not talking about as part of the ritual. I'm talking about as a practice to get yourself used to recalling your dreams because there's no point in having this magnificent you know, earth shattering reality <laughs> shaking interaction with a being from another world. If you can't even remember it, you know, it's like meeting, it's like meeting Gandhi or Elvis or something. You don't even remember the interaction. So that's the first step is to get to remember your dreams and the basic method, do a ritual, call on the spirit, ask it to appear to you in a dream, place its sigil, or whatever under your pillow. Um, but again, I'd be very careful who you do this with. People do this at their own risk. This is not safe. Uh, traditionally, um, there are exorcisms done over the bed. You know, I'm, I'm not even talking about a magic. I'm talking about you go to the old medieval stuff. You go to like the, you know, the Orthodox church has this just every day just in general there's an exorcism done over the bed so as you can see dreams and especially an in-between state um 
there are times when you're really vulnerable. I've had people message me, telling me about how they've had really bad experiences uh, and sleep paralysis, stuff like that. I went into just one of my experiences in my last video, but there were so many things I didn't cover. I just touched the tip of the iceberg. So it's definitely not a safe method, but it is a very easy method to use. Uh, yeah, and that's the main thing. Your main magical tool is your pillow and your pillowcase. <laughs> and Agrippa, he points this out in book one, chapter 59. And I used to experiment with this, and that's the best way you could do it. Uh, back in my early pagan days, and I'll go into uh, some other aspects here in a little bit. Uh, but way back in my pagan days, I still have an affinity for Greek philosophy and, and, and Greek literature. It's absolutely amazing. But I used to put Homer's Iliad under my pillow, and every night I would have the most vivid warlike dreams. Every night. Like I was actually um, in, in, in my armor and in... And, in battle so and you know and this is why i always recommend when people are having nightmares to place a small bible under their pillow and i know it's real, real really christian like but if you're a pagan you could take um you know uh, let's say you're into hellenistic stuff you could do the same thing you could get a small greek mythology book or something and you could place it right under your pillow and you could do this with anything uh like as a Christian, I place the rosary, sometimes a Bible under my pillow. And um, you can actually use this method to prevent bad dreams, to prevent spirits from coming in. So you can actually reverse it as well, so, which is interesting about this. So it doesn't have to be just, uh, getting, just to get answers from spirits. You can use this to reverse it to where you don't have nightmares, to where you don't let things in as yeah. well. And you and I both, I mean, we're, we're independent Catholic priests now. <laughs> Basically, we're Catholic priests. Um, we're just not through the Vatican. So we're independent Catholic priests, but we're not, we're not you know, I don't want people to worry. I'm not going to start pushing religion on people, you know. But if you're pagan and things are bothering you, you can adapt that, you know. Ask, a, ask your goddess or deity to protect you. And, you know, put, put an altar that they have next to your bed, and that will get you to, you know, protect you. Now, if we're getting into the paganism stuff and the Celtic mythology, we have the goddess Epona. Um, she was a, a goddess associated with horses and, you know, like pony, Epona, and uh, she dealt specifically with dreams. So if you're like a Celtic pagan, uh, the goddess Epona, you can get her to talk to you in dreams. Uh, you can get her to protect you if you're being harassed by spirits, which does happen. Like I said, in your sleep, you're vulnerable. And the last thing you want to do is to get start getting unwanted attention in your dreams. Now, that's something interesting. When I started using this method, other spirits started contacting me. Like, okay, we did our dream working with the Arbitel and all that. I started working with a totally different grimoire. I don't even remember what it was. I was working with a totally different group of spirits. And guess what happened? This, that spirit, the new spirit I was working with, it was like, oh, you do dream work. Here, I'm going to contact you there. So these are basically like different av avenues or methods you know, like someone can write you a letter, someone can call you on the phone, someone can hit you up on Facebook Messenger. These are all like, this is like that. There are different ways that spirits can talk to you. And like I said, I started doing dream work. And when I worked with another grimoire, totally different group of spirits, they started coming into my dreams, you know, and really you're opening up a new doorway for spirit contact. Yeah, and this is really important. 
So we should really go into protection here. Now, uh, you're right about the altar, and I'm going to go into that. Uh, I have several different things on my altar um, to where I can just reach over. And this is the most important thing, right? Uh, for example, um, if you were to have an altar, for example, one of the most classical things you can have to protect you is an iron tie. Spirits don't like iron for the most part, especially uh, demons and some of the classical grimoires. And this is mainly because it represents Mars. Mars, the uh, planet of conflict and war, you know? <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's so interesting. Interestingly enough, elementals don't seem to like iron either. Mm -hmm. And some people think that it may have to do with interrupting their magnetic fields. I try not to go down that rabbit hole too much because it's speculation. I try to stick to the practice. But some people speculate that iron is able to interact with their, their energy field. So that's why you have steel, sword, and the Solomonic Circle. Uh, so that if you get a nasty, you can swipe at it. And, uh, I mean, that's the whole thing with the black handled knife. You know, you get a, you get a, a spirit that's not too nice. Oh, why don't you step outside your circle and show me your knife? Um, <laughs> so grimoire magic is adaptive. They, they developed a sword. Uh, we actually know one lady, she does, she works with the heptameron and other grimoires. She developed uh, Solomonic throwing knives. It's uh, pretty badass. I mean, basically you have, this is your protective equipment. It's not so much what you're calling as all the other things that will be drawn to your ritual, like moths to a flame, you know? So you'll get yeah, yeah. attention. Yeah, and that's why it's, it's, it's really good to have things that are important to your spirituality next to you um and we see these as i would like to say as a backup plan yeah you know these are the first things you go through whenever a dream goes bad you know like if you're a catholic not, not just the dreams though like other things can go really bad yeah. you know what i mean yeah. oh yeah what, what you're doing is you're opening up an astral doorway and things can start interacting in other ways with your life as well you know yeah i mean this in terms of like when you wake up right um and, and you're in a cold sweat and, and you know you had a terrible nightmare and that's just not your normal way of thinking you know or you're terrified and you know things like that you'd never have a dream like that something's really wrong and you know that it's something supernatural so um and a lot of times that's because that there's something there uh i my first teacher uh, he was Jewish he was my first occult teacher and he told me something really interesting that in Jewish folklore if you, there's Jewish people make their beds because if they if a spirit sees an outline of you there the spirit will actually t uh, get in your outline so you always make your bed and I was even watching uh, another interesting video where a priest says to sprinkle your bed with holy water. Once again, very Christian, but you, uh, I also seen something real similar from the uh, PGM to where uh, there's a salt-like substance that's, that you can use in the same way, the blessing of the salt and, and everything else. So once again, it's good to have these, to have all of your stuff for emergency. For, for example, if you're going to use something in a ritual, Take some of that ritual stuff and put it on your bedside altar for protection. And uh, and that and that's the main thing. Once again, maybe not protection for like from Talison said, from that particular spirit that you've called. But once again, you have a doorway with a whole lot of other things interacting with you. And that's the most important thing. But overall, once again, you have to kind of see this as uh, the you have the corporal and the incorporeal mean meaning one is physical one is something you could see in the corporal and then one is incorporeal one doesn't necessarily have a physical body <laughs> so just bear that in mind i'm not going to re repeat it too much but 
yeah, that's the main thing that I'd like to say. And have this all planned out too. Know what you're going to call. Know what you, exactly what you're asking for. And know the method and know exactly how to give thanks or, or a license of departure. And last but not least, um, you know, keep a journal. That's probably most important. And, th and those are probably the easiest steps to it. And there's a, uh, some grimoires re require a ritual. Um, I've had some personal experiences where it didn't re require a ritual, but just a simple prayer. So once again, there's so many variances you can do here. Yeah, and I would also recommend closing the door. Um, upon waking up and writing down the dream, I would give a license to depart. Go in peace into your habitations and abodes with the blessings of Adonai or whatever your, whatever your magical tradition. I would do some type of a, a release because, I mean, it's an evocation. You know, whatever you call up, you need to release. Um, or give that license to depart. So like I said, I would wake up, write it down, and then give the license to depart, basically. Yep, and the uh, last thing we need is to see, when, and I've seen this with people, to where it was just a repeat of Faust all over again, which is real sad, because they don't treat these methods uh in terms of their sacredness and in terms of treating this as a science and dealing with spirits. So once again, this is a method, this is a science, it's thousands of years old. And actually, if you look, look all the way to the key of Solomon, um, you know, for example, in a rabbi Solomon chapter 17, talking about, uh, you know, a love spell, it's not that different in the PGM. I mean, 2000 years of history. I really doubt that the author of the rabbi Solomon even read the PGM. That's how simple this technology is. Yeah, definitely not. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I want to stress that there's really no protection here. There's no circle. It's just you coming face to face with a spirit um, where it can reach out and grab you, essentially. So <laughs> there's no circle. There's none of that. So I would be careful who you, who you tried this method with. Um, the Shem Angels are good. Olympic spirits from the Arbitel. Uh, planetary spirits, if you're pagan. Um, pagan deities. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so basically the method, I would create a bedside altar. Now, your bedside altar should be clear. You don't want to have an oscillating fan and, you know, like clothes thrown about the room. You want to clean up the room. You want to tidy it because this is basically your temple. Think of it as a sleep temple. You are preparing yourself. You are preparing the room for a connection with the higher being. And it's really important to prepare yourself. Um, just like if you're going to have a date or something, you're going to want to, you know, tidy up. So basically clean your room, make sure it's tidy. I recommend having a bedside altar, nothing else on it. No oscillating fan, no alarm clock. I don't even think people use that anymore, but you know what I mean? You don't want your phone charging on the altar. Clear all that off. You're going to want to have an altar with, you know, basically things that are associated with that spirit. If you're going to try working with Mars or Jupiter or Venus, have stones, crystals, metals, colors, things associated with that spirit. I do not recommend leaving a candle burning by your bed because really freaky things can happen with grimoire magic. And the last thing you want is while you're asleep, for that candle to topple over and then, you know, light things on fire while you sleep. <clears throat> so, um, bedside altar, you can light a candle, say your prayer, snuff the candle out. You want nothing burning. Maybe burn a little incense, let it burn all the way out. 
make sure everything is extinguished before you go to bed. Basically, bedside altar, things associated with that planet or spirit, place its sigil or name under your pillow, have that altar by your bed. So as you sleep, the things associated with that spirit are near you. So if you're working with Saturn, have onyx, <clears throat> have black objects, um, have things associated with Saturn by your bed. If you're trying to work with Venus, have copper, um, have emerald, have, have things that are associated with Venus by your bed. Or if you're working with Mercury, have agate. You know, you get the idea. Basically, you want things by your bed associated with that spirit. And that's using correspondences. And that goes, of course, into Agrippa. Um, <clears throat> it goes into ancient hermetic magic, all of that. So basically, bedside altar, do your call, ask it to visit you in your sleep, go to bed. And then have your dream, wake up. You're going to want to have a spiral and write it all down. Because the last thing you want to happen is have an interaction and then forget. So you're going to want to write everything down when you wake up, give a license to depart. And um, that's basically it. Planetary hours can be used. Now, something that I've noticed and lots of other people have noticed talking to other magicians that actually work with this stuff, you know, people that actually do the stuff, talking to them that have used this method, naps seem to work better than a full eight hour sleep. So you can do it before you go to bed for eight hours, but it might be easier and more productive to try taking, you know, a 30 minute hour nap and uh and you know set your alarm to wake up in 30 minutes or an hour and try that out so basically try it out and see how it works for you and um yeah i mean that's that's basically it you know i recommend purifying the area just like you would purify a magic circle or a temple I would sprinkle blessed water or holy water around the area. I would burn some incense. I would make sure everything is clean and pure. And um, treat this like you're in a temple. Your bed is your temple. That is your temple. Okay. So you're going to want to treat your bed and your, your sleeping area like your temple. Clean, sprinkled with blessed water incensed and purified and you yourself want to be in a purified state i would not rep recommend any heavy meals or anything you know i would try this on an empty stomach and um yep that's basically it and we're gonna have much more much more coming out um on this type of stuff we have a really important interview coming up uh talking about a classical grimoire so we have lots of awesome things on the way. Yep. So is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Um, yeah, pretty much. And you can't say it enough. You know, just, um, just, just stay safe doing this. Uh, try to know what you're doing the best that you can with the right spirit in this form of evocation. Follow the process. and. You laid it out very well. Make sure you know your correspondences. <laughs> you don't make too many mistakes with it. And um, that's about it. You pretty much nailed it. All right. Yep. It's a super um, easy, simple method. And it's something that can be employed. And it's a great, um, it's, it's a great tool to have in the Magician's Toolkit. So, uh, yep. This is Tally Simic Knight and Robert Powell. Uh, thank you for joining me, and we hope everyone has a wonderful day. All right, God bless.